Our speaker today is Professor Chisa Hotta from the University of Tokyo. Chisa is a theoretical condensed matter physicist carrying out research on frustration-free quantum models. Um, uh, by way of background, frustration-free Hamiltonians are important in some areas of condensed matter physics and quantum computing because they um, allow for a simpler analysis of some of the properties of quantum systems and they're easier to study in those cases. But not only that, they also shed light on some more fundamental aspects of the applications of quantum mechanics to many body systems. Uh, but as mentioned in Jesus' abstract, the business of determining uh, whether a Hamiltonian is frustration-free can be challenging. Um, and it's dependent upon how a particular model is constructed or, or, or interpreted. Um, uh, as I mentioned before, Chisa is a theoretical condensed matter physicist at the University of Tokyo. As you might have seen from her abstract, she graduated from the University of Tokyo before taking a postdoctoral position at Riken. And then after um, um, being employed as an assistant professor and a lecturer, she moved back to the University of Tokyo in 2014, where she now teaches and carries that research. Chisa is also the recipient of the Young Scientist Prize from the Ministry of Education, Sport and Culture of Japan. I'm looking forward to this talk. This is an, an interesting area of condensed matter physics. Um, so thank you very much, uh, Chisa, for um, being prepared to grab this talk. And um, her talk today is entitled Frustration-Free Models and Matrix Product State Solutions. Thanks very much, Chisa. Um, over to you. Thank you very much for the nice introduction. Um, my name is Tisa Hotta. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the frustration-free models. Um, this is like, uh, this. there are two related papers here. And um, I'm particularly focusing on the fact that uh, MPS can do a lot of jobs. So um, I basically work not on not on other, just only a condensed matter theory. So I mainly focus on the material side usually, but I thought that today the audiences would be a bit more wide in their scope so that I try to focus much more on the numerical part. So this is a list of what I'm, we're doing in our group, frustrated magnetism, low dimensional quantum magnets, strong correlations, organics, flat bands, and other stat physics problems. But um, you see, it's a bit more tricky to explain all the backgrounds of each two topics. So it might be better, I thought, to focus much on the technical part, which we can probably share a bit more overlaps with other fields. So today's talk is about um, the matrix product state use descriptions of the many body state, particularly focusing on the frustration free models. And this work was done by my student, Hide Saito. He's in the second year of my master course, and he did a lot on this work. So first, I'd like to go from a scratch of what the frustration free is, and then explain a bit more on the MPS in the basic language. And then I go to the main part, cluster projected matrix product state, and then go to further to explain why I did the job and how it works. And I finally refer a bit to the fact that the frustration-free problem is a KQSAT problem in numerical complexity theory. So these are the outlines. Okay, let me start. So what is frustration-free? So when we call frustration, it's a situation where we have a conflict in trying to lower the energy of the system. So the simplest example is a geometrical frustration, um, which is realized, for example, in a class classical antiferromagnetic Ising model. So this is the model. We have spins pointing up or down, which can be described in the black and white dots. And then if we just place the spins on the triangle, we can first decide two of these sides to be black and white to satisfy the antiferromagnetic energy gain. Okay, And then if we try to decide the third side to be black or white, we always have a conflict in either of the remaining two, side, two bonds. So it means that we cannot simultaneously make all these three bonds to be lowest in energy. And indeed, if you faithfully calculate the energy of this triangular unit, we can see that the lowest energy state has six different like um, degenerate states, 
which we call U, U, D, or D, D, U, up, up, down, or down, down, up. So we have two black and one white or vice versa. And all these energy, all these states have the same energy minus J. So the situation of being frustrated means that we cannot decide the unique state. So we have a degeneracy in the ground state. Now, if we want to just construct a triangle lattice out of this triangle unit, what happens is that we have much more numbers of degeneracies in the ground state. This is known from a very old, old age. And the uh, degeneracy is like very massive. This is a like a entropic density, which is remaining at the zero temperature. So then, if we just try to make, formulate, or evaluate how frustrated the system is, uh, we can probably adapt the idea given in 1987, which is called constraint function. So let's just prepare two quantities, the ground state energy E0 and EB, which is the sum of the lowest energy of local bonds. It means that uh, we can we just count the lowest energies of all these bonds and then just sum it up. And if the ratio of these two energies are like one, it means that it's frustrated because um, we, we are very not, very not good at just making these two energies match with each other. But if it is minus one, it's gonna be unfrustrated, meaning that the sum of the lowest energies of local bonds is equal to the ground state energy. So um, in the frustration-free models, we say frustration-free in the context that all local energy can just, the lowest energy of the local manifold can match the global lowest energy. So that we call a frustration-free. And indeed, if you just, just like play the same game for the triangle lattice or on a triangle unit, you can say that this frustration constraint function, Fc, is going to be 0 0.333, meaning that this like closer to frustration. So the triangle lattice Isaac Gandhi for magnet is a frustrated system in that context. But <clears throat> so we can then define the frustra frustration free Hamiltonian in such a way that let's just prepare a local projective Hamiltonian HL, which is acting on the very small part of the system. And then let's just make the global Hamiltonian of system size L and N as a sum of all these HLs. And then if you find a zero energy ground state of the total Hamiltonian, it means that all the local HL is zero because we have set this local projected Hamiltonian to be positive semi-definite. So this is the definition of what we call the frustration-free Hamiltonian. So if the system is frustration free, we can satisfy all the local like manifold HL to be lowest in energy altogether. So that's what we want to have for a frustration free Hamiltonian. But um, the problem is that we do not know whether HL and N is frustration free or not until we really solve the problem. Because uh, what we do is that we first prepare a uh, frustration uh, candidate of the frustration free Hamiltonian by summing up the local projector Hamiltonian, right, in this way, which is pos positive semi definite. But we don't know until we really get the lowest eigenvalue of this Hn until it is zero, right? So we need to anyway solve this global Hamiltonian in order to determine whether the model is frustration free or not. But unfortunately, many of the problems which we want to focus on is a quantum many body problem. So solving this Hamiltonian itself is not an easy task. So let me just briefly explain these two points, how to make a proper choice of HN and how to solve it. The first thing is um, how to determine the local projector HL. So let's just take a look at the triangle lattice Ising anti antiferromagnet. This is a classical model, so it's, it's more simple to explain. But now we can like divide this bulk triangle lattice into the sum of the local bonds, which is two body, right? This is a usual construction of the Hamiltonian because quite many of the Hamiltonian are consisting of the sum of the two body terms, right? In this way. 
But in that case, as I mentioned earlier, the system is frustrated because all these two body terms cannot simultaneously lower the energy in order to get the lowest energy of the bulk Hamiltonian. So it is frustrated. However, if we divide this triangle in different manner, like it, it can be a unit of these small triangles, which has three bonds per unit. And then we can say that the total energy of the bulk, lowest energy of the bulk Hamiltonian can be the sum of the lowest energy of this small unit. And in that case, we can see it as frustration free. We can make another construction, not by a corner shear triangle summation, but by an edge shear triangle summation. This is also another choice, but also has a frustration free construction. So it means that the terminology frustration or frustration free is not clear enough until we define it. So if we just could this define a proper choice of HL, we can design a frustration free Hamiltonian as we what we like. So it's a matter of definition. So let me just briefly explain why these two latter two choices can be frustration free a bit more. Um, previously, uh, we introduced the triangular lattice Isengendorfer magnet as a sum of the local two body terms. But if we just make it as a sum of the this edge shear triangle, for example, um, we know that for each triangle unit, the lowest energy state is two, two black and one white, or two white and one black. But then it's known from 1950s by the exact solutions by one year that the lowest energy of the bulk triangle lattice has all these triangle units. Whenever we see any of these triangle units, it, also, it consists of either of the six types of configurations. So it means that we can make this triangle lattice ising magnet as a constructions of the frustration free type. Uh, why we have this UD or DDU to be Low, lowest in energy is that we can, for example, let's just focus on this hexagon. This hexagon is surrounded by black and white alternatively, right? And then we can just flip the center side black to be white without changing the energy at all because this center side is connected by three black and three whites. So it means that we can choose arbitrary configurations for at least one third of the sides and it will already give a lot of degeneracies in the ground state. So that will explain why the triangle lattice ising interferon magnet has a very large entropy at the zero temperature. So this example will tell us that we can just like design a frustration-free Hamiltonian as we like. As far as we can get the constraint that uh, we can just get the condition that the total Hamiltonian has a zero energy. Well, then, if you just go from a classical to the quantum many body problem, solving this HN itself is not an easy task because um, it's one of the most like uh, concentrated areas of theoretical physics, as it was. This is because um, the numbers of the Hilbert space dimension for the quantum many body system grows exponentially with system size n. But usually we have many, many approximations or tools to realize actually a very good approximation of the ground state. Why it can be possible is that even though the whole, whole Hilbert space of system size n is very, very large, we in reality use only small numbers of uh, basis set among them to very efficiently describe the ground state. I can explain a bit more by using an MPS language, but uh, before that, I would just go with uh, constructions of the MP um, general quantum many body wave function. So any of the quantum wave function, just this is like this function, if we just divide a system into two parts, A and B, can be written in this form. Like uh, we have um, the local Hilbert space of dimension MA on A and local Hilbert space of dimension MB in this region B. 
and then the combinations of these two local part of the basis set will form these large numbers of summations to describe the whole wave functions of any of the ground states spanned on A plus B, right? But then it's well known that any of these constructions can always be like reduced to so-called Schmidt form. So this is an exact conversion of the left-hand side to the right-hand side. So in the left-hand side, we have MA, MA times MB combinations of the numbers of summation. But here we can reduce it to small numbers of summation by making a unitary transformations on both sides of the basis. And then we have a like a double summations to be single summation because the indices of uh, the basis of site A, uh, region A and region B are in one-to-one -one correspondence. They will not stick to just i basis will be connected to i basis of B. And if i is different, they are not connect with each other. So we can make a one-to-one -one correspondence between the basis set by making the unitary, unitary transformation. This is called a Smith decomposition. We can do it always. And the good thing is that once we do this Smith decomposition, this lambda, which is a Smith called a Schmidt value, is going to decay very rapidly with the num with this indices i. So um, we can make a cutoff until we this lambda reaches a substantially up to the value which lambda is substantially small. So this is a reason why we can treat the many body wave functions in a tiny subspace compared to the whole of the space. Um, so making use of this kind of uh, Schmidt decomposition, we can like uh, quantify how difficult to describe a quantum many body state. And it can be measured by the so-called entanglement entropy. So the Schmidt value has a distribution in terms of I, index I. So if, it's, if this has a very deviated bias distribution, which what we call entanglement entropy is going to be zero. But if we have a nearly flat distribution, it's gonna be very, very large. But usually we have this kind of a very rapid decay of lambda so that the interval entropy is not so large. And the prototype example is a 1D quantum spin system. And this is a very famous paper by, uh, by this, these two very famous guys. And this is about the entanglement, entanglement entropy calculated for the 1D quantum spin systems. So if we have a critical like gap, gapless, um, state like an XX chain or like an XY chain, we can have a logarithmic growth of the entanglement entropy, but still it's not so large. And if we have a gap system, it can be more suppressed to become a constant value. So it means that uh, we can just reduce the numbers of basis for these kinds of 1D quantum systems to a very small number. And that is why we can efficiently describe the 1D quantum state efficiently. So for that, the MPS or the DMRG is going to work very well. So, so I was just probably many people know it, but I would just explain a bit more. What is MPS? The MPS is a way to describe, for example, a 1D quantum system as a, as a sum of matrix products. So the matrix is given as a tensor with um, two, two hands on both sides and one leg on the bottom. And this leg is a degrees of freedom that will denote the local local up and spin up and down degrees of freedom. So we if we, you have a spin one half, this uh, blue leg has a dimension two. And the left and right hand given by this red bond, denotes how much numbers of numerical resources we need to describe this quantum many body state. So we can just rewrite the coefficient of the of this um, many body wave functions, which is spanned by the Hilbert space indexed by this i being up and down over one to n sites. And if you just like make a multiplication of all these matrices indexed by these configurations, 
And then we get the coefficients of these bases. That's the way how we describe the MPS wave function. But now if we want to exactly describe the wave function, what happens is that this red leg, if we just make an open boundary condition and just start from the left-hand side, the numbers, dimensions of this um, tensor or A is going to grow very rapidly, d, d squared, d cube, blah, blah, blah. And then it's going to amount to the whole Hilbert space dimension. So this is not affordable. So what we do is that we make a cutoff on the dimension and that is the way how we make an approximation. But to make it very efficient, we do a so-called a canonical form transformation. So uh, originally we had this kind of matrix product form, but Whenever we have this matrix product form, it can be reduced, I mean, converted to a so-called canonical form. It's just a matter of converting this tensile A into the product of this gamma, tensile gamma and lambda, which is a diagonal matrix, which is like including the Schmidt values. So <clears throat> suppose we have a canonical form and then, if we divide the system into two, two, two parts, A and B, just like we did before. And then <clears throat> we see that um, the when we make a division as some, some M, M bond, which is between M and M plus one side, we have this um, lambda matrix, which is um, like including the Schmidt values as a diagonal matrix. So it means that we already have in this canonical form, this Schmidt form. So whenever we cut the system into half at any point, we can immediately get the Schmidt values, which is like stored in this gamma matrices. And this gamma matrix has a dimension chi times chi. It's a diagonal matrix. So if you calculate the entanglement entropy by bipartiting the system at site uh, bond M, we get the entanglement entropy, which is lambda squared times log lambda squared summation. And the maximum value of this entanglement entropy in this construction can be the log of the bond dimension chi max, which is given as a constant if we make an approximation. So this is why NPS is called an area area law bound, having an area law bound, meaning that the, the amount of entropy or the amount of entanglement this MPS construction can store has an upper bound, which is determined by this bond dimension chi. Okay. So then um, with, but MPS still has a very good aspect. Once we get again, this canonical form from this uh, primitive matrix form by converting A to gamma times lambda. And then if we want to calculate the expectation value of the operator OJ on the J side, which is a local operator, we just convert this canonical form upside down and make a trace. And this can be given in this form but then this operator O is acting only on the J side, and then it's acting only on the gamma on the J side. So, and the other part, which is off that side, well, once being like uh, taken this kind of a uh, um, expectation value, it's gonna be a unit matrix. So it means that if we want to calculate some local expectation values, we only need to care about the matrix gamma and the lambda just on that matrix, which this would operate. So the wave function once converted to the canonical form can be determined very locally. So that's a very good benefit of using the MPS in a many body problem. But uh, the problem is that it's considered to be good for 1D system because of the fact that it has an area low bound. And, uh, but now, I'm going to just show the example that it can be used much more efficiently for our construction in the later part of my talk. Okay, but um, the MPS has been very, very successful in the context of so-called density matrix memorization group, DMRG. It was invented by 
white in 1992, and there are quite many people in Australian community which is a professional of this DMRG. So um, what, what DMRG do is that they divide the system into half at many um, different places and just make the bipartition place sweeped from left to right and right to left and right to right. And every time they optimize the left and right basis to get the optimal like uh, form of the basic basis set that should be remained to describe that state. And just, just doing this sweep many times, we can variationally optimize this um, uh, MPS form, and that will give almost exactly the ground state of the one-dimensional system. And that was a great success during the that last 30 years. Now, so um, let's finally refer in the introductory part what the frustration free Hamiltonian is. Um, so I would just show two famous examples. One is an uh, AKLT model. I suppose quite many of you know that um, Ian Affleck has passed away quite recently. It's a very sad thing. But anyway, this is a model which Affleck, Kennedy, Leaf, and Tasaki has developed quite a long time ago. So it's an S equals one model with um, Heisenberg term as well as an additional, bi I mean, a biquadratic term added. So it's an S equals one Hamiltonian on a single chain. But good thing is that this AKLD model is known to be an exactly solvable model. And it's a good platform of the MPS. So the trick of getting a lowest energy state of the AKLD model is that um, we can rewrite this AKLD Hamiltonian as a sum of these, um, this we cannot say it rewrite. It's a, just a sum of the bonds. And this bond Hamiltonian can be written as HL, which is a local projector Hamiltonian, which I have mentioned. But this form, S dot S times S dot S squared plus the constant can be converted exactly into the form that it will project out the total spin two terms for each of the pairs of the spins on right and left side of the bonds. We have two spins forming this bond. And then the total S of these two spins, we have zero, one, two, right? And then we can project out P2, S equals two, for all different choices of these bonds. And that will, okay, make this AKLT Hamiltonian, meaning that if you have S equals zero or one on each of these like two pairs of spins, we can, that, that state can join the ground state. If it is two, it can be excluded from the ground state. And indeed the AKLT state is a state that um, can be written in this cotton picture. So if you think of this S equals one spin as a sum of two S equals one halves, the maximum total S that can be attained per S equals one unit is going to be zero and one. So this is a cotton picture of how the AKLT state looks like. And once we get this projector Hamiltonian form, uh, we know that um, indeed this kind of form will be satisfied. And indeed this AKLT Hamiltonian has a zero energy ground state. So it's a frustration-free model because it's a simultaneous zero energy state of these each bonds and of the total ground state. Okay, another trivial example is a toric code. Toric code is probably one of the most famous models. And um, this is a trivial example of the frustration-free model because um, we have the toric code as a summation of these two types of terms, A and B. A is a product of these four spins, which is on the this like cross. And B is a product of four spins on this placket. And we can easily calculate that this A and B are commutative. So it means that 
A and B can have a simultaneous eigen state. And also we can show that A and B has both the eigen state of plus minus eigenvalues of plus minus one. So it means that once we have this kind of form of the Turek code, the ground state will be the simultaneous um, ground state of all these like local operators A and B, and they all have the plus one eigenvalue. So this is a very trivial example of frustration free in the case that uh, all the terms consisting the Hamiltonian is commutative. But um, we know other frustration free models that are not as simple, but still are solved. These are the lists actually of the frustration free models. Um, AKLT chain, I have referred to it previously. Uh, there's a like a famous model called Magenta Gosh chain, which produces a singlet product state. Uh, this is also quite a mathematically trivial example once we know it. There's also um, a series of model called Motzkin chain and Fredkin chain, which are coming from the quantum information theory. It's not a condensed matter model, but it is known to be solvable and it can be also written in terms of MERA or the MPS. And also there's a model called PSP light chain and PXP model is a model for the quantum scars. And these four, latter four cases are all condensed matter toy models, but a very famous model that generated a very interesting physics. For example, Russell Kibbelson point is a point that we have a quantum spin liquid, just like a toric code. Kitaev toric code is also a quantum spin liquid. And we also have a frustrated three color and color Kagome model or the anion model on the zigzag XYZ chain. But anyway, <laughs> you can see that all these frustration free models are solvable and also being very famous and can be a source of interesting physics for many physical fields. So we wanna just make more lists of frustration-free models, but we not we need to know how to do that. And that's the present topic which, which I wanna address. So I was just uh, going to go to the main part of my talk. It's about a cluster projected matrix product state. It's a way to design a frustration-free Hamiltonian and its exact MPS ground state. So let's revisit AKLT again. Okay, so it's a sum, it's an S equals one chain, and it's a sum of the bond Hamiltonian HL, which is a local projector Hamiltonian. And this HL works in such a way that they it wants to exclude, ex exclude S equals two state per each pairs of spins and only remain S equals one and zero. So, um, then it can be written in such a way that it will project out five S equals two state in this way. And if you want to write the representations of this HL in a matrix form, which is given by this project QL, it will take the um, form of local dimension nine to be the numbers of um, numbers of columns and five rows, which will denote the constraint of projecting out five different S equals two state. And the element of this QL is nothing but a Klebisch golden coefficient because this will just denote what S equals two states are for the local dimension that we have just a uh, local Hilbert space um, description that we have just prepared as a uh, indexed by total S and total SC. Okay. And then if you just operate this QL to the ground state and make it zero, it means that it's going to fulfill the condition to have the ground state. And indeed, if you just operate this QL to all these, um, all uh, if you just prepare all these QLs for all these bonds and like operate on the ground state, it will make, make it zero. So that's the way how to get the ground state instead of um, just calculating the 
energy eigen energies of the Hamiltonian. This is another way. And indeed, if you just try to describe again the matrix product state form, the AKLD wave function, which is very well known. Um, this is the matrix product form of the AKLD wave function given by three pieces of um, different matrix A. If um, if A is having S Z equals zero, it's gonna be a power A Z matrix. And if it is like plus and minus, it's gonna be a plus and minus, meaning S Z equals plus and minus, it's gonna be um, the sigma plus and sigma minus operators. So we just make this projection to, to just check whether it's going to work. And then you can easily find these relationships between A, A's, different A's. And this is in one to one correspondence with making a projection using um, operating, I mean, on the matrix Q like this. Um, just in the previous slide, I have just showed Q. And then um, putting Q onto this AQLT state means that we need to fulfill these relationships and it is actually fulfilled. So you can just describe the ground state in such a way that this projector Q will just work to zero out the excited state. So we do the same thing for the general, more general problem. So let me just go with example of the triangle lattice because I quite favor triangle lattice. So let me just consider the triangle lattice unit. It consists of three S equals one half. So the dimensions of this local Hilbert space is two to three times eight, and two, two, time, two to three equals eight. And among the eight side, we want to divide the Hilbert space into two types, the zero energy state and the excited state. And then we can like define the local projector Hamiltonian in such a way that the excited state has a non-zero energy. But the zero energy state has a zero energy, so it does not come out in this projector Hamiltonian. There's a kind of penalty Hamiltonian to the excited state. Okay. And then let's just combine this HL to make a bulk lattice. For example, we can construct an edge shared um, triangular chain, which is going to form a zigzag chain. And then we can define this form of HN as a summation of this HL. This is just a form, like we just can like propose this kind of form. And then we can get an explicit form of HN. And then we need to judge whether this HN has the zero energy ground state. And if it is, we can say that this Hamiltonian is frustration free. But whether we have zero for this Hamiltonian is, can be just described in this way. So the ground state can be Schmidt decomposed into this green triangle and other part like this. And then if we only have uh, this composition as having a non-zero Schmidt values for these green guys, it means that this condition is satisfied. So we want to have this kind of state, but you can say that this ground state is highly entangled between different triangles. So it's not simple enough. So how do we do it? So what we think is first to construct the whole Hilbert space of dimension D to N. If D is two, it's gonna be two to N. Okay, but not right now we have eight. So eight to N is going to be our like, uh, no, it's a two to n. I'm sorry, two to n. Okay, and then um, let's just try to keep this L triangle to have the zero energy state and don't care about other triangles. And then we can define a subspace out of the whole super space that this green triangle has the zero energy state and other part has the full silver space to be kept. But then we can also construct another Hilbert space as a cup of these local VLs, meaning that if we make a cup of all these Ls for all these triangles, it will exclude all the non-zero and eigen 
and all, all the non-zero excited blue states for all these triangles. And if the dimensions of this uh, newly created um, newly created subspace, which is a cup of all these VLs, is non-zero, it means there's a there's a kind of a space remaining to get the exact ground state for the over the whole triangles. So the dimensions of this cupped VL Hilbert space is going to give us a ground state degeneracy. So then let's do it more practically. So we know already that we can prepare a projector for a single triangle like this. It's uh, It takes a form of the local dimension times the numbers of constraints, numbers of excited states. And then we can combine all these QLs in this manner to make a blue ball Q. It has a very large dimension. The the I mean the numbers of like um, numbers of columns is a total Hilbert space dimension, and the numbers of rows is very large also. So usually we cannot calculate this guy, but um, we can express Q anyway. And if this Q has a rank uh, which is smaller than the total Hilbert space dimension, the difference between the total Hilbert space dimension and the rank of Q will give the ground state degeneracy. So we want to know whether dn is non-zero or not by constructing Q. But um, unfortunately, this can be cannot be done because it's a very large size matrix. So what we do is that we make use of the locality of the MPS wave function. So let's try to make um, MPS in this kind of construction. So we first try to construct an MPS from the left-hand side by the open boundary condition. We just add three different sites one by one. And up to three, we keep all the Hilbert space dimensions as it is. But now when we reach three, we have to make a constraint because this three forms a triangle. So we want to project out the five states out of uh, four, I mean, uh, several, I mean, not five, any, any part of the states, excited states up to some, I mean, at this three, three site unit. So we just operate this projector. And then we operate this projector and determine this pink guy, right? Then and again, we increase one more side. The one more side will share the triangle with the two successive sides before. So we need to operate another projector these three, to these three guys, which is newly created, including newly created pink guy. And with this projector, we can determine the element of this newly added pink guy. We do it successively until we reach the system size that we want. And every time we increase, and if that increased site belongs to that projector local unit, we need to make it determine that pink site to make, to, to determine their matrix element like this. And when we reach the system size that we want, we finally end up with this large matrix form, which will form an isometry, meaning that this dn, which is the left-hand side one dimensions of the final matrix, is going to give us the numbers of degeneracies of the ground state. And because we have dn degenerate ground state in an MPS form, which is sharing the n minus one different MPS on the left-hand side, we can divide each of them into small parts of wave function independently and get the wave function. So that, that, is, that is how we get the MPS um, exact ground state. Here, we are not sacrificing anything. We're just adding one by one the matrix and determining this element by locally projecting out the part of the hill space. But here, we are making full use of the fact that the MPS is local. So we only have to take care of this local pink guy to get the exact round state one by one. 
So that's the way how we get it. So this is one of the examples of um, how to make a projector. This is called a the Lisanovsky model. Um, it's a model for quantum scars. It looks quite complicated, but we can rewrite this model as a sum of a local Hamiltonian like this. And this Hamiltonian can be written in this projector form, which is acting on three different adjacent sites of the spin one half. So what we do is that we iteratively project out this like uh, projector Hamiltonian guy to construct a whole like ground state. And that can be done in a very efficient manner in a very small numerical cost. Okay, so why, I would just explain why, why we came to this like topic, although we are starting from the condensate theory. So um, recently we have just uh, examined the model called um, X spin one half zigzag chain. So this is a Hamiltonian, which we were studying previously. So it is a summation of the Heisenberg term plus the anisotropic spin exchange term. So it's going to mix the X and Y components of the spins. So it's not SU2, but uh, it's, anyway, it's a quantum mechanical model, which is spanned on this zigzag chain. Now we wrote a phase diagram with this newly added gamma term on the vertical axis, and also the degrees of J1 and J2, uh, ratio of J1 and J2, which is going to dictate the frustration effect of the geometry. And then we get this kind of phase diagram where we have four, five different phases that meet at a single point. And we were studying this model because uh, it was a model material model for the material called YBCUS2, which we were interested in, in the condensed matter context. But we just forget about it any, anyway. And then, oh, wait. And then why, why we were reaching this kind of MPS language is that in this phase diagram, we found that there's a line which is exactly solvable. And this um, multi-critical point, point lies exactly on this exactly solvable line. And this exactly solvable line lies at the place where J2 over J1 equals exactly 2 of 0 0.5, 0 0.5, meaning that we have uh, like twice as large zigzag interactions compared to the leg interactions. So it means that along this line, this zigzag chain model can be divided into the sum of these triangular units. And if we did a numerical simulation, we exactly find that the ground state of the total Hamiltonian is the n times the numbers of the local lowest energy Hamiltonian like this. So it means that this line is a frustration-free point. And the motivation of like constructing our theory was to solve this kind of exact solution on a phase diagram. And indeed we did that for the this present model. And this is a result of the MPS construction. This is an exact MPS and it's a bond dimension which is growing rapidly towards the system center. And then just go down again. And it's a place where we bipartite the system. So, and then we can get the entanglement entropy as such that is going to be like this, which is still feasible for the MPS language without sacrificing any of the, like uh, we, we did not reduce any information, but it's an exact MPS, but still we have this kind of profile. And if we do the calculations on this zigzag chain for DMRG, we get smaller numbers of um, entanglement entropy because DMRG is always choosing the lowest minimally entangled state, but our MPS is like taking care of the full ground state, set of ground state, which is the journey. So this is a difference between the exact MPS and the approximate DMRG solutions. Okay, then what else can we do? So we can design a frustration-free model across different models and can obtain a topological order state and also calculate 2D models. I just rush very rapidly. So um, one thing we can do is that 
we have just talked about triangles, but we can parameterize the basis that we want to um, exclude as a penalty term. Here we exclude two terms out of eight bases, but then these two terms can be tuned by this, this green coefficients, alpha and beta. And by varying this alpha and beta, we can get the solution diagrams. And the solution diagrams all, all, all over has an exact ground state for this construction. And varying this alpha and beta will vary the shape of the total Hamiltonian constructed from the penalty Hamiltonian. So we can like connect different solutions between different types of models or from the parameters. So indeed, um, that green parameterization will connect. I mean, I had just shown, okay, I have shown A, B, C, D, E, F points along these diagrams, which is included in this parameterization, or have the exact solution. But then if you just look at the previous my um, previous researches, we find that these A, B, C, D, E points appear as a multi-critical point in different types of phase diagrams from different, slightly different models. So we can say that different exact solutions appearing in different models or phase diagrams can be connected in our like constructions. This is one thing. Another thing, we can treat torical models as well. This is a 2D construction. So we can, okay, this is the torque code that I have just mentioned. It's a summation of uh, like vertex and plackets, which is writ written as this vertex and plackets, red and blue. Now we make an MPS path along this like, we, we, make, a, we make a cylinder out of this uh, 2D plane. And then we draw an MPS path along this yellow line. So we just, we just make 1D snake chain, which is going in this way. And the, just going through the first row, we don't have any projector because it does not form any placket or the vertices. But once we go to the second, second row, we encounter this blue projector. And there we decide this blue matrix. Now we just go to another pink one. Here, this site is included in this blue and this red projector. So we project out this blue and red and determine this red guy. We do it in the same manner until we reach the end of the system. And by this construction, the one dimension first grows very rapidly. And once we encounter the projector, it's going to be reduced. And again, up, down, up, down, just reduce again like this. But anyway, we can safely construct the exact round state in the MPS form in the historical two-dimensional plane without sacrificing any information. So here um, we have shown the one dimension and the entanglement entropy. Now um, we can also calculate for the historical model, a topological entanglement entropy. Now the topological ground state is no, topologically ordered ground state is known to have a so-called topological sectors. Um, it's just, I mean, I'll just probably go to one more slide here. So we can just define a loop operator and this loop operator is going to give us a, a plus and minus eigenvalues, which is running in a horizontal and vertical reaction which if we form torus. So we just form a torus and cut the torus on, along this line or along this line, and that will form a loop operator. And this loop operator has an eigenvalue of plus or minus so that we have four different sectors which are independent. And these four sectors have completely separate Hilbert space. They don't talk to each other quantum mechanically. So we can have four degenerate ground states which are totally the same in their ground state. So we have four for degeneracy. But now for all these sectors, we can exactly evaluate the entanglement entropy 
by cutting the torus into half. And then we can do the size scaling for the entanglement entropy and get the constant term, which is, you see, you can see that it's gonna be like minus log n. This is called the topological entanglement entropy, uh, known to just prove that the correct code is a Z2, Z2 spin liquid. So our construction is giving us a independently the topological sector very accurately. And we can also like describe the excited state for all these topological sectors independently as well. We can also do it for other 2D models. This is a triangle lattice construction. This is Kagume, ladder, and squares. And these are the bond dimensions and the endowment entropy. <clears throat> and we can <clears throat> see that the dis distributions of chi and s are not so beautiful. But um, in any case, we are the resultant phase diagram, and uh, I'm sorry, the resultant width function is an exact wave function for all these models. So we can practically calculate the exact solution for the frustration-free example. But um, just that frustration-free free is not a simple problem. I was just mentioned for maybe there should be a quantum information guy here included. So I'll just make a connection with the QC, KQSAT problem finally. So I have just <clears throat> talked about how to construct um, MPS ground state by designing the frustration-free Hamiltonian candidate and to confirm that it's frustration-free. But I have mentioned that we don't know whether HN is frustration-free or not until we really saw the model. So this is one of the categories of something called QKSAT. It's a question of whether the Hamiltonian is frustration-free or not. And if it is yes, we can, of course, try to find an actual ground state wave function, which we did by our construction. And this KQSAT is called quantum satisfaction problem, which is a QMA1 complete. It's an analog of NP complete, meaning that um, by the classical computer, we cannot solve it within a polynomial time. So it's a very difficult, generally a very difficult problem to solve. Then uh, how can we pin it down to the case set? So this is a classical case. So for the, for, the, for example, two body Ising model, we have like N spins, which is denoted by N logical variables, Boolean variables, which will give for upspin, yes, and downspin, no. Okay, this true and false, I'm saying true and false. And then we can define M constraints on the variables, which is acting on K independent variables. So M constraint, for example, this, this two body term, the two body term will like act on two spins. So it's K equals two. If we have a three body term, it's going to act on three spins. It's going to be k equals three. But for the k body term, we can, for example, anti-ferromagnetic Ising model can be described in this logical term, like such that we don't want up, up, or down, down. So up, up, and down, down can be excluded as kind of constraint per bond. So we can define for each penalty term this kind of uh, conditions that will form m different conditions throughout the system. So this is called the KSAT problem. So even the classical KSAT problem is considered to be very difficult once we go to k equals three. And this is actually the um, work that tried to check numerically how satisfied or unsatisfied this case that problem is in general by using a random numerical simulation. And it turned out that if k equals two, meaning that if you just make a two body Hamiltonian or something, and then if the numbers of constraints, meaning that the number of penalty terms is large, it's going to easily become unsatisfied, meaning that it's gonna be frustrated. But if you go to k equals three, um, the more we need a number of constraints to satisfy. But um, anyway, this kind of problem is called KSAT. And if K is larger than three, I'm sorry, this is like equals three. 
equally larger than three, it's an NP complete problem. And it's known that all NP, NP complete problems can be reduced to three sad. So this is a quantum case, but there are some class, uh, uh, this is a classical case, but this is a quantum case as well. This is a quantum KQ sad problem studied, but they haven't risk like uh, not much has been done, but uh, still a bit has been done. So one example is that um, this was done in 2010, that the uh, chain of d-dimensional qubits can be just, re I mean, made out of projectors like this, acting on two adjacent qubits. And then they showed exactly the range of solutions that they could just satisfy. So this gray region is somewhere we don't find a frustration-free solution. And this, um, Otherwise, this white region, we have many solutions or many solutions with entangled or unentangled product state solutions. So judging whether we have a solution or not can be done for particular constructions in a previous manifold and um, previous context. And for more complicated contexts, um, there is a work done by Roderick Messner and his group that um, <clears throat> Here they consider the stat fist problem of quantum KQ set by making a quantum classical mapping of the partition function. And they solve the range upper bound of where we can get the frustration free solution and where we cannot. So this red line is a place where we have an unsatisfied solution. And this purple and green ones are the ones that we have a frustration free solutions. So basically, uh, the region where we can have a solution can be like judged in some like particular manner, but not always. So it's quite a difficult problem. But why we did it, why we why, why we were able to solve this kind of solution was that we were making full use of the locality of MPS. So as I mentioned in constructing a frustration Hamiltonian, a frustration Hamiltonian, we first uh, propose a candidate Hamiltonian, which is a sum of HL. But we don't know whether it's going to be frustration free or not. So we check whether we have a solution or not by like increasing the system size one by one and checking whether we have a, like a reasonable dimensions of the matrix free, matrix product state solutions by determining the latest added matrix uh, constituents. And if they have a solution, we can continue to increase the numbers of size one by one. But if you don't have a solution, we stop the calculation and discard that candidate. That what that was what we were doing. So in the end, because we were doing with one by one additional like site creation. Um, the resultant shape of the MPS is not translation or invariant. So it's not beautiful. But um, by sacrificing that beautifulness, we can get the very practical solutions of um, MPS form. So that's why we could get um, reasonable answer to this frustration free problem. And previously, uh, it's very known from the early stage that if you have a translationally invariant MPS, we can get always a parent frustration-free Hamiltonian. This is well known. So if we, you are given an MPS, we have a frustration-free Hamiltonian. But vice versa, if we are given a frustration-free Hamiltonian, if we, are, if we are given any Hamiltonian, we cannot know whether it's frustration-free until we solve it. So we have made these two arrows to be equally possible by making use of the non-translationary invariant dirty form of the MPS, but still this exact. The advantage of solving this kind of solution is that if you find the finite size exact solutions for some model, you can, for example, this is a like a braiding statistics found in quantum computer which makes use of the exact solution. This is also uh, observations of the topological phase transition in a quantum computer, uh, which is done along this exactly solvable path, which is given in this black line. So um, 
having an exact form of the finite size um, exact solution will give us a platform to study more physics that we have not encountered before. So that's, I think, to be the benefit of getting an exact solution for the restricted numbers of models. So this is going to give you the summary. I think I have just made a bit of overtime. Sorry for that. But so this is the way to practically solve the frustration free problem by making full use of the locality of the MPS. And thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, T. So that was a really interesting talk, actually. I, I didn't realize that these matrix product state approaches um, were so versatile. So it was really interesting. Um, do you, um, so so what, this is probably a silly question, but what prevents you from extending it to, to three-dimensional problems beyond the two-dimensional case? It's just because of the blowing up of the bond dimension. Okay. So, um, you can probably, oh, okay. So it, it is it just numerically, mathematically, the problem just gets too too burden yes. burdensome. Is that what we're saying? For example, this is the two dimensional case, right? Yeah. And then if you only have a corner shed constructions of this triangle, for example, for the carbon map, yeah, constraint is very small. So that the Hilbert space dimension or the bond dimension blows up very rapidly. Yeah. If we have three dimensions. We need to like grow the system size and to make constraints much more. But the, the numbers of constraints, constraints are probably smaller than the blowing up of the system size. So right. that is a matter of practicality. So if you could find a model that could have enough constraint and could go to large system size, we can still do the same game as 2D. Okay. That's mm -hmm. But 3D, we do have a very good mean field solution, I think. Right. Yeah. So we don't have to probably do with the quantum many body that much seriously, right? Yeah. So basically, we want 2D. Yeah. It's very, very interesting. I mean, um, do you know of anybody um, who's uh, attempting to apply any of these models to uh, problems in super superconductivity? Um, basically, what we're making use of is the MPS. Yeah. And superconductivity is not a prototype good platform for even for DMRG. Yeah. Because it's, it has less conservation quantity, right? Yeah. For example, the numbers of, numbers of like particles or numbers of total SC, everything is not conserved. So it's going to be some sort of, usually what people do is that they just put some auxiliary path onto these like DMRGs or something. Yeah. And then just make it like kind of a gland canonical construction. But yeah. it's going to be highly costly. Mm -hmm. So usually it might not be a good approach to do. For yeah. example, uh, electrons are already already quite difficult, I think. <laughs> it's like a toy mold. I'm, that's I'm why I'm just getting like, ahead of yeah. myself here. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I mean in, in superconductivity, we have um, uh, the Merman Wigner theorem. Yeah. Uh, which, you know, uh, for people who don't know, is a, is a statement that in a two dimensional system at finite temperature, yeah. it's not yeah. possible for yes. a continuous symmetry to. Yes. Uh, to be right. broken in two dimensions, which seems to imply that, which seems to forbid no, super, no true long range superconducting state in the two dimensional exactly. system. Yes. But in experimentally, we know that uh, there are two dimensional systems that exhibit some superconductivity. Uh, for example, in high temperature superconductivity in the cuprates, where we have these copper oxygen planes, and they're weak, they're relatively weakly coupled between adjacent right. planes. Yeah. So we have this mm -hmm. semi two dimensional uh, um, plane mm -hmm. and uh, it, it's but in the explanation there uh, the belief there is that we've got a quasi uh, long range um, order uh, yeah. which is often related to a topological phase coherence oh, I see. so I was wondering whether that uh, but from what you've said maybe not uh, would be susceptible to a uh, frustration free Hamiltonian or a step further to uh, your matrix approach but it sounds like it might be um, pretty difficult. In my 
like very intuitively, I would say that, um, okay, so frustration-free is a particularly local, local yeah. system, yeah. right? Yeah. And superconductivity is having a global phase. Yes. That's, and that's quite right. in that context, it might be a bit like off from what we're doing in that yeah. context. Because um, of course, topologies are always like attracting people. And one, I mean, one criticism from what we were first doing this method was that the, we probably cannot access the topological order or topological long range thing. Yeah. yeah. Then we did the toric code to show it practically it's possible. But it's possible only because we have a finite size. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's a matter of a kind of practicality. But this is a very toy toy model, right? Toy yeah. model already has a kind of confirmations on what we're doing. Yeah. So in that context, we can probably play around. So it's more or less closer to what we're doing with quantum magnetism or with computer simulations or quantum simulators or cold yeah. atoms. Yeah. That is cool. a more fitable like platform for our case, I think. It's it's still surprisingly um general. That's 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 mm. what it was made. I try to make it general. So in reality we're trying to go beyond excellent. frustration free. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um uh, the, in the QA there's a question from DC yeah. Lewis saying what's the relationship between Chi sub n and n in one and two dimensional systems? Again please um, um you can probably read it in the I can um, just share, see the chat right yeah you can probably see um, the uh, Q and A panel but for the benefit of people that might be looking at the YouTube, uh, what's the relationship between chi sub n and n in one and two dimensional systems? She asked. Uh, chi, chi, chi sub n. Okay, okay. So um, it really depends. Uh, wait. It really depends on what kind of system we approach. So, uh, for example, this is a famous 1D. 1D system with entanglement entropy of maximum log n or constant. In that case, it's very super easy because um, we know that the chi is not going to blow up that right rapidly. But for 2D, there are several cases. So 1D, we have gapped or gapless. And for gapped, it's going to be constant. Chi is constant, right? And for gapless, it's going to have log n, right? And for 2D, we don't know until we do it. So for example, this case, Kagome, it's going to increase exponentially, okay? This is going, because the entanglement entropy is following a volume law. For, for example, for square lattice, by accident, we know that it's very constant, Kai is constant, because the entanglement entropy is like almost like an area law. We have an upper bound. So it's not only a matter of dimension, but a matter of whether the system has how much the entanglement the system needs to store in the array function. So it, if it is a highly entangled state, which the entanglement will blow up very rapidly with the subsystem size, we have to prepare a large chi so that the system size we can reach is restricted to a small size. For example, this Kagome, we can only do with like 20 or something, which is not so different from the exact diagonalization. It's not good. But for a triangle lattice, we can go to like 100 or 200 sites easily because the entanglement entropy for this model is being like having an upper bound. But we don't know until we calculate it. So that's the point. So local projector information does not give us how difficult it is, the information, until we calculate it. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. And then a follow-up question. Mm -hmm. uh, do you consider boundary conditions when calculating the zigzag chain? Yes. Um, so um, in, the, in our slide, we only showed a very simple open boundary condition, like... Um, Let's see, for example, um, for um, the zigzag chain, we were just summing up these triangle units, meaning that the center part of the triangle has two duplicated bonds, but the edge bond has only a single. So we call it a cluster boundary condition. 
here we can construct it exactly the open boundary condition solution. But then we can wind the system all around to make it periodic boundary. And what happens is that among these open boundary cluster solutions, they just mix up to form a smaller numbers of periodic boundary solutions. We can do just by putting a boundary operator on it to select one of them, part of them, I would say. So we can cope with any, I mean, basically periodic boundary, open cluster boundary as well. And that's why we did it with the torus in two dimension. Okay. So I did not do, talk about the details of the technical part yeah. of how we did it. So if you are interested in, please refer to my latest archive on this topic. That okay. will give a more detailed information on how we construct it in a more abundant examples. Yeah. Okay. And then as you can see in the Q&A, he's got a second uh, follow-up question. Does this mean you do uh, the cutoff for bond dimension in your calculations as one would do in DMRG? No, we don't do that. I mean, basically what DMRG do is that we, for example, this DMRG calculation, um, we just sweep, sweep, so sweep, and every sweep and every cut, we do the Schmidt decomposition and take chi, chi largest eigenvalues and of the Schmidt values. So we have like more Schmidt values, which are having a very small weight, but we discard it. That's an approximation, which we call truncation. And that's why we get this finite bond dimension at some point, like for this green line at 10, we start to truncate. So this is going to be flat, right? Yeah. But then if you do do with the exact solution as ours, we don't cut off anything. And then it blows up throughout. And because it's symmetric about the center of the system, the true bond dimension is like also reflectively symmetric. So we don't cut off anything for our construction, but then we need to keep large bond dimensions up to a certain size. And that's what is going to determine how large we can go for each model. Okay. Well, thanks, Chief. So that's really good. I think we should probably wrap it up there. Um, thank you very much for a great talk. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah.